Chair, okay. The uh, Rules Committee will come to order. We uh, are not quite at a quorum yet. We're getting closer. I see uh, Sheriff Nugent is attempting to get into the room, and uh, so we're just uh, one shy of a quorum, but uh, Mr. Van Hollen doesn't count as a quorum. So uh, who is that? Oh, Elsie's here? She's sitting right out here. Okay. So, so we're very close to a quorum, but uh, we, uh, Mr. McGovern, has very generously, as is always the case, uh, stated that we can go forward uh, without a quorum. We're here for consideration of three measures, the Continuing Appropriations Resolution, the National Security and Job Protection Act from the uh, Budget Committee, and the uh, No More Cylinders Act from the Energy and Commerce Committee. Let's begin with the... Um, the very important continuing resolution, and I'm very happy to uh, welcome two of my closest friends in the Congress, my classmate, the distinguished chair of the Committee on Appropriations, Mr. Rogers, and my fellow Westerner, the gentleman. And we now have a quorum in the room, I'm happy to say, thanks to Mr. Webster joining us, uh, my very good friend uh, from Washington, uh, Mr. Dick. So let's begin with uh, Mr. Rogers, and uh, Mr. Chairman, thanks for joining us, and uh, Look forward to uh, any prepared statement that you have being entered in the record without objection, and uh, and we welcome your summary. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much for uh, hearing us. Uh, we are here to uh, seek a rule for H.J. Res. Uh, 117, the CR uh, making appropriations for the first half of fiscal year 2013. Uh, this six-month CR uh, will avoid a shutdown keep the government functioning until March 27th of next year. Uh, this is basic and necessary legislation that uh, must be in place before the end of the fiscal year on September 30. We find ourselves, Mr. Chairman, in uh, this inconvenient position uh, after the Senate failed to uh, act on any of the 12 appropriations bills this year. Uh, I remind you that uh, the House considered seven of the 12 bills on the floor, uh, before learning that the Senate uh, did not intend uh, to follow through on this basic duty as representatives of the American people. I'm very disappointed that this work will not be completed before the end of the fiscal year. Uh, this should not become the uh, standard of operation for the government. It's not good governance. And it's risky for our nation's financial future, but it's absolutely necessary that we pass this CR in this situation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to shortly summarize the bill, uh, it's a good faith effort, uh, bipartisan, bicameral, uh, good faith effort to provide limited but fair funding for the federal government abiding by the Budget Control Act agreement level of a trillion forty-seven billion uh, in discretionary funding. Uh, we kept it limited in scope with levels held at rates essentially consistent with uh, fiscal 12, and we included absolutely no earmarks, no extraneous policy riders. We made minor adjustments to prevent detrimental, catastrophic, or irreversible changes to uh, federal programs uh, and to ensure good government, including provisions uh, to maintain border security, uh, staffing levels, monies to process veterans' disability claims, other critical issues. Finally, we provided $6.4 billion in additional disaster relief funding uh, to take care of those affected by recent and past natural disasters. My committee intends to continue its work on these must-pass appropriations bills over the next six months. Uh, so that we can hopefully pass bills that will fund the government the balance of the year uh, and assure that we have ample time to complete this work by the next uh, deadline. Uh, before I uh, yield time, I want to take a moment to uh, uh, speak on the great career of my partner, ranking member of this committee, Norm Dix. This likely would be his last uh, appearance before this committee in seeking a rule for the Appropriations Committee. Uh, although, if we come back in lame duck, uh, there may be another opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Norm has just been a tremendous uh, workhorse for his people and the American people and the Congress uh, for all these years. Uh, and uh, he will be sorely missed. He will leave a large... Uh, 
a large uh, hole in the fabric of this institution. Uh, me personally, he has been a, a great partner in the appropriations process since I became chairman. We've worked together closely. Uh, he's been extremely constructive in his uh, advice and renderings, uh, and uh, we've become very close personal friends. Uh, he maintains his views and, and uh, positions on issues that we differ on, but uh, he's a professional. He understands that we all have different viewpoints and is willing to abide by that. So I want to say to Mr. Dix what a great uh, pleasure it has been to work with him and a great honor uh, to have uh, this kind of a public servant uh, by, your, by your side. Well, thanks, thanks uh, very much, and, and let me, uh, in recognizing uh, the distinguished ranking member, say that uh, you have provided extraordinary service, and I suspect maybe you and I agree on a few more things than Harold and I agree on, uh, you know, on, uh, on, on occasion, uh, being uh, from the West. But I uh, uh, have appreciated your friendship and, uh, and your strong support. We've worked very closely together on international trade issues, which are important to uh, to our cities, which uh, are uh, in port areas, and and uh, and I just want to say that the recognition that you have made of what we've been able to do to open up the appropriations process is something that you've done publicly and privately as well. And I just want you to know that I appreciate um, the fact that not everyone has been willing to do that, but you have, Norm. And I just want you to know how much we appreciate uh, the fact that you have uh, have recognized what we've been able to do and so you're now recognized. Thank well, thank you. you and I want to thank the chairman for those kind remarks. Uh, while I would much prefer to be doing as the chairman with our regular bills, I support this continuing resolution. HJ avoids a government shutdown by continuing the full range of federal activities at last year's rate of operations plus uh, 0.612 of 1%. Uh, the CR also preserves the agreement on spending levels in the Budget Control Act. In addition, the BCA establishes reforms and budgeting for disaster relief, which this CR maintains. This is a bipartisan measure that deserves our support. However, I must mention two concerns. First, I am disappointed that if we have yet to enact a single FY13 bill in this Congress. Congress. I know Chairman Rogers shares my disappointment. Federal agencies need much more direction than is provided in a CR, and I believe this measure serves to underscore the need for timely, regular appropriation bills. I'm also deeply concerned that the threat of a sequester inhibits economic growth and job creation. The sooner we deal with all the fiscal cliff issues, the sooner our economic recovery will be strengthened. Just yesterday, Moody's threatened a potential downgrade of the U.S. government's uh, credit rating in 2013 unless Congress takes action to avert the fiscal cliff. I wish we could turn off the 2013 sequestration in this CR and enact a balanced package of deficit reduction to replace it. Unfortunately, any serious discussion seems impossible until after the election. I certainly do not consider the other measure before the Rules Committee today a serious or balanced attempt to reduce the deficit. Uh, as Chairman Rogers has said, this is a streamlined CR, free of any new contentious writers, and negotiated in a bipartisan fashion. I urge my colleagues to support it. And I, and I will say this, I have re enjoyed very much working with Chairman Rogers on trying to reestablish regular order in the Appropriations Committee. It was, you know, some of, the, some of those evenings when we're out there on the floor uh, going through amendment after amendment, you, you know, you might think about uh, uh, going back to a, a more regulated uh, approach. But I think it was the right thing to do. I, I strongly support the chairman's leadership on this and, and have enjoyed working with him and, and his staff uh, this year. And, uh, um I, again, uh, we support this bill. Thank you very much. I mean, it underscores the uh, the bipartisan nature of it. Uh, somebody once said that if everybody's unhappy with a bill, it's probably a pretty good piece of legislation. And uh, and again, uh, I have concerns about it. There are a number of questions that uh, that have come forward, and I, I know a number of people have raised them. But I believe that we need to move ahead with this. 
so that we can see next year getting back to that uh, uh, regular process. And uh, I hope and pray that we'll be able to, uh, maybe with Norm Dix and David Dreyer out of Congress, they might be able to uh, finally uh, get the work of the Appropriations uh, Committee done. So I have no questions other than to thank, thank you both. Ms. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, your self-effacing remark, um, notwithstanding, I, I don't think we'll be better off without you and Mr. Dix in the Congress next year. Um, I want to thank the two gentlemen from the Appropriations Committee for coming. Um, I do want to um, agree with them that this is not the way we should be operating. We should be passing our bills. I'm proud of you all for having gotten seven bills onto the floor on this side of the building. Uh, and I think we need to point out again that the problem is not here, but is um, on the other side. Uh, as one senator said uh, about a year ago, the place over there is moribund. And as Rush Limbaugh would say, for those of you in Rio Linda, that means dead. And so um, we uh, have a real problem uh, with uh, things going from our side of the building to the other side of the building. But I thank you for your good work. I thank you for the comedy you show with each other and um, appreciate your efforts. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Governor. I want to thank you both for your work. I regret that we're here and haven't finished all of our appropriations bills, and the other side is not cooperating, but um, uh, it's not the fault of, of either of you, and um, I have no questions. Hard work, and we'll look forward to seeing your measure considered on the floor, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, this member would like to say to the chairman, uh, who's uh, a classmate of mine, as, as has been said, how much we appreciate the service of this chairman, David oh. Breyer. Uh, who has Time of the gentleman's expired. <laughs> <laughs> As you wish. No, we're, we're thankful for your service. You've been a great uh, member of Congress for your state and country, but also a, a tremendous chairman of this very important committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's go on to our next bill. Okay, that'll uh, end the hearing for a conserve HR at Res 117. Uh, next, uh, from the Budget Committee, the National Security and Job Protection Act, we have uh, Messrs. Garrett and Van Hollen here. Gentlemen, please come forward. Without objection, any prepared statement that you have will appear in the record uh, in its entirety. Uh, we know that Mr. Garrett is here representing our uh, vice presidential candidate, uh, who uh, would normally be here, but uh, I suspect that uh, without appearing his, before without the Rules Committee is not critical to... Uh, yeah. is not critical to uh, the uh, the outcome of uh, of the election. So we appreciate uh, the fact that both of you are here. And Mr. Garrett, without any objection, uh, any prepared statement that looks like you have a beautifully prepared statement there, it'll be uh, entered into the record. Okay. And we welcome your summary, and I'll say the same to Mr. Van Holland. Yeah, so um, in my prepared statement, actually, is a, has already, already been redacted down to quite a, a short period of time. So I appreciate the uh, committee uh, consideration of the legislation. The committee is familiar with the... Uh, the issue that we'll be facing with with the sequester about to occur, with the, with the draconian cuts that will occur not only to defense, um, which has uh, been raised as an issue, but across on the domestic side as well. And as the chair is also familiar with the fact that uh, the House has tried to address this issue uh, repeatedly, um, looking to the Senate to, as a collaborative uh, ally to solve this issue and to the White House, but unfortunately um, has been, I guess you would say, rebuffed in, in both regards. Um, and so that's why we're here today with H.R. Uh, 6365, the National Security and Job Protection Act, would accomplish two things. Basically, it would lay out the parameters for one to say that all we need to do is simply uh, implement a sequester that uh, would put us on a sound financial track to either abide by the uh, legislation that this House previously uh, passed. I think it was back in May with, I think, most members of, that are here actually voted in favor of. Um, to uh, reduce spending over a five-year period of time and within the first year and offset the uh, sequester. And secondly, to uh, require the President to submit a uh, legislative proposal to replace the sequester with his proposal for savings no later than October 5th. And at that point, of course, we're still waiting uh, anxiously for the administration to say how he would implement the uh, sequester 
if he does not come up with a plan of his own. So I appreciate the uh, committee's uh, consideration of this legislation, and I yield back. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members uh, of the committee. Um, I ask that the committee uh, make in order a substitute amendment uh, that, if it were passed by the House, would actually immediately uh, replace the entire sequester, both on defense cuts and non-defense cuts. Uh, the difference is that it does it in a balanced way, uh, meaning it includes a mix of cuts, uh, including cuts to some of the direct uh, payments uh, and farm subsidies, uh, but also uh, eliminates uh, subsidies to the big oil uh, companies, uh, which have totally outlived any usefulness uh, they may have had, and ask folks at the very top end of the income ladder to pitch in uh, for our national defense. Uh, we've got a, a budget uh, in the House that calls for increases in defense spending beyond what the Joint Chiefs and staff have asked for, and yet nobody seems to want to pay a penny uh, for defense. Uh, we put two wars on the credit card. Uh, now it's time to ask everybody for a little shared responsibility, and that's what our substitute amendment would do. And I would point out that our substitute amendment will actually replace the sequester, unlike uh, the bill that's before the committee, which if you pass it, and it was passed by the Senate, and the President signed it, would do nothing. It would do nothing. It wouldn't, it wouldn't remove the sequester. It just creates a process uh, spelling out some possibilities for uh, replacing the sequester. If you pass the Democratic substitute, it will. Now let me just say a word about the President. The President submitted, he's already submitted a plan uh, that would replace the sequester. We do it in a balanced way. And in fact, the rules of this House have been rigged so that if you introduce a balanced plan, meaning one that includes any revenue for the purpose of replacing the sequester, <laughs> the rules make it out of order. So you've already made out of order the President's approach because the President takes the kind of bipartisan approach that's been recommended by bipartisan groups that includes a mix of spending cuts uh, and revenue increases. Uh, but of course, this body's waived the rules many times for the purpose of putting in order um, various Republican proposals, and I hope that in the interest of transparency uh, and the democratic process, you will allow this body an opportunity to vote on, on this uh, substitute amendment, which, if passed again, would actually prevent the sequester from taking place, not just create a process. The final point I would make, Mr. Chairman, is that the Republican proposal, uh, again, even if it were signed by the President, doesn't remove the sequester, but it specifically leaves out <laughs> of its process, the across-the-board cuts that would take place to Medicare and other non-military direct spending. Uh, in other words, it creates a mechanism for turning off the sequester if, if the, there's a substitute that replaces uh, the defense cuts and the non-defense discretionary, but it actually provides a green light for the, the across-the-board 2% uh, cuts to play, takes place to Medicare uh, and other things. So. I would just uh, ask the committee again, in the interest of letting this body really uh, exercise its will, uh, to put the substitute amendment in order. Well, thank you, uh, thank you both very much. And uh, you know, the uh, the notion of saying that the, ru the rules are rigged uh, is I, I consider to be a, a mischaracterization of where we are. We have a germaneness requirement that does exist, and I recognize uh, very much the desire of the gentleman to uh, come forward with a proposal, but uh, again, we, we have the germaneness issue that does need to be addressed, and so, uh, you know, we want to have an opportunity for a free-flowing debate, and I believe that arguments will be able to be uh, propounded on this issue, but uh, I think that um, for us to at least proceed, and there was recognition across the board that the idea of a sequester was, was troubling, and there was a great desire to come to an agreement. And um, we are where we are at this juncture. And uh, so the idea of at least taking a step, I believe, is the right thing to do. Ms. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no questions. Mr. McGovern. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Van Hollen. First of all, I agree with you. The rules are rigged. And they rigged them. And they can unrig them. Uh, they can provide a waiver if they want to. Uh, they do. They've done so in the past for legislation that benefits uh, their interests. But uh, when it comes to uh, doing anything that might make an order uh, a proposal that is authored by a Democrat, they're not so generous. So uh, I think you are absolutely right on that. And I just so I can understand, I can repeat what you said. I mean, uh, this bill will have no effect on the sequester unless further legislation is passed. This bill will have no effect on the federal budget unless further legislation is passed. 
And this bill doesn't even have a chance of passage in the United States Senate. So if this bill doesn't affect the sequester and doesn't affect the budget and won't, won't pass the Senate, then what, what the hell are we we're doing here? Well, Mr. McGovern, that's, that's a good question. As I, as I said, our substitute amendment, if it passed, it would actually do something about the sequester uh, immediately. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office, not me, says CBO estimates that enacting H.R. 6365 by itself would have no impact on the federal budget. And that's a fact because it does nothing. I mean, if the President signs this bill, it does a big fat zero. It, the sequester would still take, take effect. If I could just, on the rules, because it is important that everyone understand what the, what the rules provide, you cannot have one dollar of revenue raised for the purpose of replacing the sequester without violating the rules of the House. One dollar. That's a violate To replace the sequester, that's a violation of the rules. So the President's put lots of proposals on the table. It's not that he hasn't put proposals, just our colleagues don't, don't like the balanced approach he's recommended. Yeah. Well, I guess, I, you know, if, the, if, if our purpose during these very few days that we are back in session, um, uh, if the purpose is to try to get something done and to do something that benefits the country and the American people, uh, this is not it. They ought to allow, um, uh, if they, they, you know, they want to, if they have a, if they have a similar proposal that they want to uh, replace the sequester with, they ought to bring theirs. They ought to let you, you bring yours. We, we ought to have a real debate on real legislation that really matters and not just a sound bite. I mean, the frust yeah, the frustrating thing um, is that I think I think this is true all across the country. When people look at this House of Representatives, I mean, they shake their heads in disgust. I mean, this is the most ineffective Congress I think we've ever had. And um, they're expecting us to address issues like jobs, get the budget in order. Uh, they want us to pay for these wars. People are horrified when they learn that we're just putting it all on the credit card. And we come back, and we're doing legislation um, – that, uh, you know, doesn't really matter. Um, and I just, I, you know, rather than more show business, I think we need a little bit more substance here. And, um, you know, this place is becoming, uh, you know, a, a chamber where trivial issues get debated passionately and important ones not at all. And the reason why this is not important is because it doesn't have any meaning and it's going nowhere. And this is about trying to, you know, have something for a commercial, you know, in the upcoming election. I think you, we've had enough symbolic votes. We've repealed health care dozens of times. We've had so many votes on hot button issues, I've lost count. Uh, and, you know, so they certainly have enough of their campaign commercials. The question is, you know, when are we going to get down to actually solving problems? I, I guess maybe at this point it's a lame duck, but this really, this is, this is, this is a waste of time. Um, and unless they make yours in order, it's, it's, you know, I think this absolutely is a waste of time. And, um, and again, I hope that, um, you know, I hope that the, I hope we will have a rule that will, uh, you know, provide you a waiver so that we can have a debate on the Democratic substitute. I yield back my time. Barrett, one particular question: um, Your bill does not contain a tax amendment that was not reported by the Ways and Means Committee. Is there a reason you did not include that violation in your bill? For the very re reason that you put it as a violation on the bill. Oh. Well, I guess that answers that my answers question, and doesn't. I'll yield back. And, and, I'm sorry, please. And, and, and to the larger issue, these are not trivial matters. <laughs> these are significant matters. And if we don't take some action, there can be significant ramifications to our economy. And I agree with the gentleman that there has been a sense of dysfunctional Congress, if you define Congress collectively as House and Senate, because as we sit here, he says we, House of I, well, if he says the House of Representatives, then, then it's not apropos. But if you describe it as Congress, then it is apropos, because as we sit here, the Congress, the Congress meaning the Senate, has failed to act on these initiatives in the past. And the legislation that's here before us as an amendment is basically trying to um, raise taxes to chase ever higher spending. The amendment that is before us today, if it was to adopt it, if the gentleman's proposal was done, done to accept an amendment to the rules to allow it, well, the would simply allow us to would simply, simply allow uh, us to get through this period of time. But the impact upon the economy would still be 
uh, disadvantageous. Right. The outside rating agencies have already said that we cannot continue to kick this can down the road. The amendment before us would only achieve approximately $5 billion total in well, deficit you, reduction. Well, for those reasons, these are not well, trivial. Well, and that's with why respect, would Jim O'Neill say correct the record or something? Uh, um, I, 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 no, I'm, I'm sorry. All right. Is there anything more that you have to add? All right. I'll get back. You generally? Then I yield to Mr. Yeah. McGovern. Please. Just to correct the record, uh, the issues before us uh, are not trivial when it comes to our fiscal soundness in our budget. That's not what I said. I, this piece of legislation that you brought, I believe, is trivial because it does nothing. You talk about not kicking the can down the road. road that's precisely what your bill would do. And if you don't like the proposal that Mr. Van Hollen uh, has, has uh, put forward, then we could bring it on the floor. We could do something radical like debate it, and then you can vote on it. You could vote no. You've got the votes to vote no. Um, you know, so uh, it's not that the issues are, are trivial. It's the way that you are treating them, and it's the way this House has treated issue after issue after issue after issue. And so that's where I take uh, that, that's that's where I take exception. I that our budget problems are not trivial. The way you're treating them is trivial. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, I ask unanimous consent to uh, allow into the record the statement of administration policy. Without objection, the, uh, the SAP will be. And I lift record. from it its second paragraph the following. Uh, the Budget Control Act, including the sequestration mechanism, was passed in both chambers of the Congress with majorities in both parties. The sequestration is now scheduled to occur because the Congressional Joint Select Committee on Deficit Reduction, established by the Budget Control Act, did not achieve at least $1.2 trillion in deficit reduction. As the administration has long said, the sequestration would be highly destructive to both defense and non-defense priorities. It was intended only to serve the function of forcing compromise on a balanced package of deficit reduction that could replace the sequester in its entirety. H.R. 6365, which contains no elements of compromise, fails to replace the entire sequester, uh, I add, as Mr. Van Hollen has said, in fiscal year 2013, 2013, and it fails to eliminate any of the reductions beyond fiscal year 2013 and fails to ask all the most fortunate Americans um, uh, to pay um, uh, their uh, fair share. Mr. Garrett and Mr. Van Hollen, did the committee have any hearings on this particular bill? Or mock-up? The committee held numerous hearings, um, which Mr. Van Hollen was at, where we discussed the severity of the problems. The committee also held hearings on the uh, legislation that you referred to earlier, where the House did, in fact, pass through reconciliation a, a bill dealing with the sequestration. So the substance to, of this bill has been discussed and uh, in the hearings. The substance of it, but Mr. Van Hollen. Well, Mr. Hayes, as, as you asked the question whether we had a hearing on this particular bill, and the answer is no, we did not. And, and you had no I think the reason is pretty clear. People would quickly see the, uh, the bill does absolutely nothing, as, as the Congressional Budget Office says. Right. In addition to uh, the fact that it, um, my mem if my memory serves me correctly, it, it, it mimics uh, and follows uh, much of what was offered by our colleague, uh, Mr. Riggle. Uh, uh, previously. But this, this particular piece of legislation, my understanding is it came to us on Monday uh, and was offered by my colleague from Florida, uh, Alan West, with uh, two co-sponsors. And now here we are dealing with something as consequential as this without it having uh, gone through uh, regular order. And it would seem to me, Mr. Chairman, uh, that it would be helpful if um, uh, Mr. Van Hollen and um, uh, the position that he takes were allowed um, uh, to uh, be made in order. Um, further, all of us know, and I've said to him, and most of us have great respect for our colleague who is now a vice presidential candidate, but it just seems to me that what you all are doing is codifying 
the spending caps in the Ryan budget, which are lower than those in the Budget Control Act. And what I can't understand, and I ask you, Mr. Garrett, how can you claim that this bill stops the sequester when everything is contingent upon further congressional act action, and then you sat there and said that uh, financial interests have said that we shouldn't continue to kick things uh, the can down the road. Can ain't got no more kicking space, uh, and we're creating kicking space. And in the final analysis, I put the question back to you: How, 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 since this requires additional or contingent action upon uh, further congressional action, well, how is that not kicking the can down the road? So you're right. So we really shouldn't be kicking the can down the road. And that's why the Congress passed and the President signed into a piece of legislation earlier this year to, to have the President send to Congress exactly how he would implement the sequester. Did he do that? No. What and so we sit here now, after, and we sit here now after the fact, waiting on the administration, which has, vi which, which has violated a law that he signed into effect and he has violated that law by not reporting back to Congress. And we now, unfortunately, are put in this um, terrible situation to have to act in an emergent matter. Would that the President have actually stepped forward and said this is how he could see it imp implemented, or would that the President actually have stepped forward and see how he would dealt with it during that period of time, we may not be here. And we would not be faced with the dilemma, of, as you indicated before, of not having a piece of legislation, as you say, in your words, not mine, do nothing. If the bill really does absolutely nothing, as you indicate, then there should be no problem whatsoever, either to uh, move the legislation along and get it through the process, because at the end of the day, aren't we really asking that the President and the Senate do finally, once and for all, to take some sort of action on this? The House of, Republic, House of Representatives, under Republican leadership, has taken action on this repeatedly, and we will take that action again now when this bill passes this week. We are just asking for this President finally to to demonstrate some leadership on this issue that we all agree is not a true Well, matter. you all had agreed before, and I'm going to ask Mr. Van Holland to respond to you. you all, all of us, all, in one sense of the word, wound up as the House of Representatives agreeing uh, with this measure. And what it boils down to is that you uh, are still insistent on breaking the deal uh, that you uh, 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 set uh, forward, and uh, I, I, I don't see it uh, uh, any different than that, but I'd ask Mr. Van Hollen to respond uh, to your question, particularly with reference to the President's responsibilities um, uh, to report. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Hastings. Uh, what, what the Congress has asked the, the President for is uh, the analysis of the impact of the sequester on defense and non-defense, and the President will be submitting that, but None of us. And when is that due? It'll be it'll be up on I believe. October 5th. I don't know exactly when it's coming, but but the point is that the, the point is that the underlying assumption. It's, it was already passed. But, but, but here the, the key the point is this: the underlying assumption behind this bill, and in fact our bill, is that we all agree that the impact of se the sequester on non-defense things like NIH and border security and air traffic controllers and on defense is really bad. We really don't need the President to tell us that again. I'm sure they will, and they'll get into a lot of detail. But, I mean, all of us, I mean, the whole premise of this effort is the idea that that would be a bad thing to happen. So let's focus on trying to avoid it. And our point is you can pass this bill that they're bringing to the House, out of the House, and the Senate could pass it, and the President could sign it, and it would still do nothing. Now, the President has submitted a plan to replace the sequester for a 10-year period. Our substitute amendment, if it was made in order, would immediately replace it for a one-year period. Their piece of legislation says, okay, here, this is the last part, presidential submission. Not later than October 15, 2012, the president shall submit to Congress a legislative proposal that meets the requirements of Section 3A2 of this act. Well, guess what? <laughs> 3A2 act says the president can't replace the sequester by... In other words, it's unconstitutional or it's believed... Well, I mean, there's, there's that. I mean, there's directing the president. But beyond that, they say, they only say, they only, not only say he has to submit a plan, they tell him what the plan can and cannot do. And what they tell him the plan cannot do is he cannot close one oil and gas subsidy to generate revenue 
to replace the sequester on defense. I mean, our colleagues are telling us how important it is to prevent the defense sequester from taking place. We agree. But they don't want the president to be able to submit a plan that reduces one tax loophole to generate revenue to replace the defense sequester. That, that, that's what they're saying to the price. It, it not only directs them unconstitutionally to submit this plan, but it, it tells them what it has to, how it has to be written. Well, I'll end um, my remarks and questioning by just saying I believe that the Republicans are trying uh, to hold the economy hostage to the draconian cuts uh, and spending cut demands uh, that have been offered. And every bipartisan blue ribbon uh, panel that has weighed in has agreed that we need a balanced package of spending cuts and revenues to dig ourselves out of this hole. But with this bill, um, the Republicans continue to say it's our way or the highway. And I hear too much of that, especially uh, in the congressional area that I serve from the gentleman that has uh, proposed uh, uh, this measure, seems to know more than everybody about everything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, the facts of the case are hard to determine sometimes for people, but the Congressional Budget Office a couple days ago came out and addressed at least just one part of all this, and that is these, the raising of uh, tax rates. Chris, do you remember what they were, or uh, you remember what they said with would be the effect if we don't, if we do nothing, we'd lose a million two hundred thousand jobs. Oh, oh yeah, which is why we have a proposal to uh, replace that with a, a balanced approach. Exactly, and that balanced approach, a bunch of economists said, would cost us some seven hundred and seventy thousand jobs. Yeah, but if you if you if you will, I mean, if you look at the assumptions, they made assumptions that are totally contra contrary to what the president has said with respect to his plan to reduce the deficit. Well, they simply took what the, what the no, they didn't actually. Well, as a matter of fact, McKenzie did. Well, I'm happy to show you the, the assumption did. that they. Scott, did their you plan. see what the outcome would be if we leave taxes where they are? The Republican plan, we'd lose no jobs. So I think it's pretty clear these darn Republicans are trying to keep jobs in this country, and the Democrats, on the sake of fairness alone, will want to lose some 800,000 jobs in this economy. And I just, I, I think it's a pretty clear case to say that at a time when we need jobs the most, I don't know who would lose the jobs of the 800,000 jobs if we increase taxes, if we tax the highest wage earners. But what I do know is this is that when you do things like that, what you do is you give the government more money and they're not even going to begin to balance the budget. They're just going to spend more money. And then fewer, more people lose their jobs and more misery takes place across this country and more people are unemployed and we keep doing what we've been doing. And that's why I find very interesting the argument that goes on about this fairness thing, just like the, the loopholes of, uh, of uh, as they describe them in energy. Exxon Mobil paid sixty, uh, paid eighteen, nineteen billion dollars more over a five-year period than their net revenue in the United States. Sixty billion more in taxes in the United States than their net than their net revenue, and. Uh, we just can't keep taxing people. That's why gasoline goes up. That's why we lose jobs, gasoline rising in prices. And I, I just think this tax and spending has come to a point where we have to say enough is enough. Every job is important. And uh, that's why we have elections. So appreciate both of you being here, Dad. You'll back my time. We're happy to welcome Mr. Slaughter back. Uh, gentleman from Rochester is recognized, and I'm Happy to note for the first time in a hell of a long time, she's okay, not on uh, that machine you were walking. No, I'm right walking like a big girl. Yeah. <laughs> so you have a foot Feels race good. before long? Oh, well, uh -huh. I, th I think a couple more weeks. Okay. I'm, I'll be ready with the best of Maybe even going to the Olympics. Who knows? Uh, I'm going to pass. I got tied up with a constituent and credit union, so I beg your pardon for being so late. But uh, thank you both for your work, uh, and uh, I will pass this round. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I could take liberty here, um, 
I just want to recognize an individual here in the audience who is an angel of adoption. He and his wife, Ed Parker, and Donna. Donna is not here right now because she's been walking too much. But Donna and Ed in my district uh, adopted six children that were a family. And, and to keep them together, they already had two children. And they took on the responsibility to adopt six to keep that family together. And they've done just an outstanding job. And I've known Ed because he worked at the sheriff's office for the county uh, when I was sheriff. And I will just tell you that, that Ed and his wife have really gone above and beyond. Uh, so I want to just recognize them. Thank you very much for being here, Ed. Uh, Thank you for joining us. You're represented extraordinarily well by Sheriff Nugent. You should know that. <laughs> Just, uh, I'm always amazed uh, at the rhetoric that we hear, obviously, um, as it relates to the fiscal cliff issues that we have in front of us about not paying for the wars, which I don't disagree with. But, you know, I got here now two years ago, and that discussion started the day I got here. But what was the party, what were you doing two years prior when you had control of this, this House, in the Senate, in the presidency? Didn't seem to be a big issue at the time. For some, I know it was. For Mr. McGovern, that has always been an issue. But all of a sudden, it is becoming the only talking point that we hear. Uh, it is always about, as it relates to our producers of oil and energy, it's always about taxing them more. And that's, you can do that. But at a time when, uh, when I'm back home and, and my county has 11.3% unemployment, go ahead and tax our oil producers more and our gasoline producers more. And at the end of the day, it's going to cost those families at the pump. That's just the way it is. And for anybody to sit there and put their head in the sand and say, that won't happen, it's going to happen. And I don't think anybody can say with certainty that it would not happen. And so anything that I would say is, let's not do things that are going to hurt, particularly those in my district that are already struggling because of the industry that the housing industry that collapsed. Um, I would be very cautious in doing that. The president, you know, two years ago, uh, before I got here, in regards to adopting what was then called the Bush tax cuts, are still called the Bush tax cuts, but really they're the Obama Bush tax cuts. Uh, and now all of a sudden it becomes a political football instead of doing what I think is right for Americans in general. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Appreciate your um, hard work, and we'll look forward to seeing this measure on the floor. And now we'll proceed to consideration of H.R. 6213 from the Energy and Commerce Committee. We're happy to welcome the uh, Chairman of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, the author of the legislation, Mr. Stearns. And uh, we have the Distinguished Chair of the Energy and Power Subcommittee, Mr. Whitfield, and the uh, Ranking Member of the Energy and Power Subcommittee, our good friend, Mr. Scott. So. Gentlemen, please uh, come forward, and without objection, any prepared statement that you have. What did I say? Oh, I said Bobby Scott. Well, sorry. Bobby Rush. Has that ever happened before? Yeah, well, I'm glad I was able to do it. for the. I like to make history up here, Bobby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, let's begin with the author of the legislation, Mr. Stearns. And uh, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. Got the green light on. There's a green light on. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Dreyer, and uh, Ranking Member Slaughter. Uh, appreciate the having the opportunity to talk to you about this bill. As you mentioned, the bill is No More Cylinders Act. Uh, this is a bill <clears throat> that um, came out of the Energy and Commerce and uh, worked with uh, Mr. Whitfield, the Chairman of the Energy Subcommittee, uh, where it was actually marked up. Um, as many of you know, <clears throat> this was an 18-month. 
uh, investigation by um, our subcommittee on oversight. Uh, it was very systematic. It was very thorough. It was very careful. Uh, in many ways, uh, we had a lot of very th serious discussion about what the Department of Energy was doing with their loan guarantee program. And as many of you know, Solender was the first poster child uh, loan guarantee that the administration pushed in which they gave $535 million uh, loan guarantee uh, to Solender, which is a California-based solar panel manufacturing company. And all of you know it went bankrupt. And I think many of you, when you go back to your congressional districts, everybody knows what the word Solender is all about. Uh, it has had a high, high profile, and uh, I think our investigation basically uncovered what would appear to be grossly mismanagement of a loan guarantee uh, that the administration uh, was, in our opinion, was abusing as a tool to generate positive press coverage. Um, the administration uh, had the opportunity to raise flags on Solyndra, and uh, there was emails that we have from the Department of Energy, Department of Treasury, and OMB that indicated that the loan should not have gone forward. So I think, Mr. Chairman, and to the ranking member, uh, the investigation we did showed thoroughly that uh, there are some corrections that we need to be made. Uh, these corrections were put together in this bill. Uh, as many of you know, that uh, <coughs> Solyndra, uh, in our attempt to get this information, we subpoenaed back in November, and it took uh, months and months and months to get the information. So it was a long, drawn-out process. Uh, but uh, ultimately, we got most of the emails, and we're uh, pleased now to say to you that we think we have a bill which phases out the Department of Energy Loan Guarantee Program by simply prohibiting uh, DOE from issuing any loan guarantees for applications submitted after December 31st, uh, 2011. Uh, it reaffirms that uh, the taxpayers will not be subordinated by the Department of Energy at any time, which, as many of you know, was done by bringing in two hedge funds to uh, subordinate to $535 billion of taxpayers' mo money. It requires the Department of Energy to submit a, a transparency report which uh, details the specific of any no, new loan guarantee and requires the DOE to first consult with Treasury prior to any restructuring of their guarantee. Um, and we, I think, hold the Department of Energy officials accountable. Uh, the Energy Policy Act of 2005 indicated you could not subordinate, yet they went ahead and parsed the legal language and did so. Uh, we think uh, on the committee, the majority felt that this was wrong, uh, but Secretary Chu did this anyway. But we made sure in this legislation this cannot be done again. And lastly, we have a GAO study, which uh, is a 10-year study on these loan guarantee programs. So I think regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, you realize that a lot of things we're talking about are important, and we uh, appreciate the support of the Thank you. Committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Stearns. Let's go to Mr. Rush and then Mr. Uh, Whitfield. I want to thank I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I am here to speak uh, on behalf of my amendment. And this is uh, uh I don't call, I call it method name for this bill is a one more innovation bill. Uh, and this bill is basically ill conceived, high handed, unnecessary. Uh, and this is what Chairman in many, many ways is uh, totally, totally uh, misplaced in the I see the essence of this bill. This bill is not in the room of me, but it's not in the room of the room of the room. The performance of the bill, you see that in the room of the room, but it's not. Republicans to keep 
So is there any news which is the main emphasis, the main rationale, the main motivation for this bill? I mean, you can do television interviews, media interviews, you can write off air pages, have press conferences, do a number of things that would be less costly um, and less timely than try to force this bill through uh, this uh, rules committee to the Congress. Congress should not, must not sabotage or attempt to sabotage or venerate an entire long program uh, that has more mirrors than new mirrors uh, that the nation looks for, the nation counts on, and, and indeed the world um, uh, is expecting from uh, this Congress and from our, our nation. This is a nation of innovation. Um, our nation is not on innovation. We look to innovation uh, to create a future for our children. And I think that um, we try to make it almost impossible for innovative uh, entities and agencies to do their work and to provide a pathway to our future. I think that that is not uh, does not serve this Congress more than ever completely well. Mr. Chairman, I strongly urge this committee to allow for an open or this and very structured rule so that members are allowed to approve uh, what I consider a deeply flawed bill. I have an amendment that will allow projects that will employ innovative technologies to meet EPA's common solution standards for a power plant issued under the Clean Air Act to be exempted from this bill. This is just one uh, type of exemption that I think is thoroughly necessary. Members of the committee, Mr. Chairman, ranking member, today there are six large scale projects to install carbon capture or storage technology in power plants currently planned or under construction in the United States. And while that's a positive start, we must do more to ensure that a clean energy future uh, exists and we can't afford to take any of the tools of full clean energy off the table, much less uh, these long grant guarantees, which have proven to be very effective uh, 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 tools for developing, developing and deploying advanced energy technologies. Uh, I want really to remind members of the committee, under this legislation, any project, no matter how meritorious the project is, uh, no matter how much in demand or how much uh, it will help provide a pathway to the future, any project submitted, submitted as an arbitrary term of zinc of December 2011 will be ineligible for long guarantees. Regardless of how some years or innovative the technology might be. And I urge my colleagues on this committee uh, to allow for the uh, rush amendment and, and I ask for an open meeting as well as allow for amendments from other leading members of the Energy uh, and Commerce Committee in order to improve what might otherwise be considered uh, an unwise piece of legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Sorry, <laughs> That's all right. He's on this house in person. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just need to. Tim Scott, too. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And uh, Ranking Member Slaughter, we appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I would say on this legislation that, first of all, I don't think any objective observer would be able to say that the 1703-1705 loan guarantee program at the Department of Energy was in any way successful. Not only did Solyndra go bankrupt, but about the first four or five loans made went into bankruptcy. 1,175 new jobs were created under the loan guarantee program. Over 15 billion was spent, billion, 
So that amounts to one new job costs $12,800,000 per job. So this legislation simply says it creates new controls. Many of us want to just get rid of the program immediately. But there are 50 applications in the pipeline, and conditional commitments have already been made by the Department of Energy for uh, a number of those. And so legal issues were raised, and that's why we couldn't terminate the program immediately. But Mr. Stearns has already set out for you the additional controls, the additional transparency, the fact there will be no more applications filed. And so we think this is a good piece of legislation and uh, should be passed on the House floor. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Woodfield, and thanks to all three of you for being here. I have no questions other than to say we're going to move ahead with this legislation. I, I uh, know that we'll have a, we'll be able to make some amendments in order. I'm not sure exactly which ones at this juncture, but I'm uh, very happy that uh, we're here and we're going to be able to resolve this. Mr. Sessions. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Stearns, thank you for appearing before the committee today. Um, your report here says on page 6, none of the 28 projects can definitely be called a success at this time. But the biggest Failure thus far is Solyndra, the California-based solar panel company that received a $527 million loan guarantee but went bankrupt. I further see where on page uh, 7 there were other companies, Abound, Solar, and Beacon Power, just gone bankrupt. What, what led us... Or was it all just the White House? Was there agreement upon the Hill to do these kinds of things? Well, I think, I think you sort of indicated that these abound, beacon, and cylinder went bankrupt. There's two more. Uh, Nevada Geothermal has substantial debt, no positive cash flow. <clears throat> First win um, is another one. <clears throat> it's withdrawn. It's IPO. And I think what we realized is that the president and the administration wanted to push the idea of these green jobs through solar panels as well as wind turbines at the expense of the economic benefit that could have been uh, done other ways. And they felt that this is the best way to do it, and I think the market shown that it wasn't viable, particularly in light of the fact that uh, China is subsidizing their solar panel industry at $30 billion a year. So to answer your question, um, and I think, that, I believe, honestly, the No More Cylinder Act uh, will change that, that the Department of Energy can't continue to go on a green energy plan unless there's economic benefit. And as Mr. Whitfield pointed out, you've got to have real jobs and not just ferry up this huge amount of money to get a very minuscule number of jobs. But I think it comes down to an ideology, perhaps even more a wish to have this green job agenda work, but the economics of it doesn't. The, um, the reason why they came to government is because they couldn't make a sound business practice work for non-government loans? That, I, I think that's clear. Um, most of us in this room obviously believe that the free market is the best area to practice new ideas. Uh, we hear that this is a no more innovation bill, and actually innovation starts in the private sector. It doesn't start with the government subsidizing companies and telling them through mandates that you have to do solar panels when the market doesn't support it. Mr. Stearns, do you believe that um, you should have done this investigation of these millions of dollars of taxpayer dollars? Absolutely. I think, I think our investigation, as I said, was systematic, thorough, and careful. Uh, every step of the way, uh, we were very careful not to move this into any area of uh, what we felt was uh, shall we say, questionable or controversy. Uh, we just laid out the facts, and I think the facts spoke for themselves, and I think both uh, sides, both the Democrats and Republicans, obviously regret that uh, Solyndra went bankrupt, and we feel that, for the most part, that the way it was handled was deplorable in which the administration was trying to prevent the bankruptcy by taking two hedge funds and letting them to subordinate all of us taxpayers at $535 million dollars. These two hedge funds, it's questionable, particularly with Argonaut, who George Kaiser owns and operates and is an investor in Solyndra, whether that was applicable. 
And then as you go down the line and get the emails and you see how all the people were raising the red flags at the Department of Energy and were raising the flags at OMB and were raising the flags at the Department of Treasury, and yet they went ahead. It sort of goes to your first point is why did the administration push this? They must have just have a strong belief in green energy as the solution rather than the free market. Well, I haven't been up here that long and on the Hill, but I think that the investigation you did was outstanding. I thought it was balanced and fair. And I'm glad that you did bring the report here with not a lot of fanfare. I think we knew it was coming, but I'm delighted that you've done this and you appeared today. This committee is open to hearing from you, and I'm delighted that you've done this, and I'm very proud of the work that you have done. Thank you, Mr. Sessions. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I also want to uh, commend uh, Chairman Stearns for the investigation that he's done. I, I have not been to any of the hearings, but I have heard you explain these things occasionally on um, TV, and I think you've done a very, very good job, um, and I appreciate what you've done. Um, I know that there's more to investigate. It's... I think you've been very kind in the way that you have characterized this in being a commitment on the part of the administration, perhaps, or a, a wish that green energy, quote, green energy, uh, would be the wave of the future and that their willingness to invest this kind of money um, are there indications that perhaps, as I think Mr. Sessions was asking, that maybe there were motivations other than a wish for the um, for green energy to work? Uh, do you, you think that it, you you implied some of that? But the term crony capitalism comes to mind. Do you believe that that further evidence may prove that? Well, I think as a chairman of the committee, I, I tried to be substantive and at the same time balanced and objective and not try to politicize it. Uh, I have actually expressed a little bit of what you talked about personally uh, when I've been asked about it, um, particularly when you read some of the emails in which uh, people who were bundlers or people who were very influential in the White House were helping out with these uh, loan guarantees and to see the back and forth inside the White House uh, at that level uh, it, it's disconcerting, to say the least, that the influence would come and to see the White House try to manipulate and juggle this to make it work. Uh, but uh, I think the facts speak for themselves that this has gone beyond just a, an investment in green energy. It's much more of a very uh, highly political adventure. Mr. Whitfield, I, I was a little stunned to hear the number that you gave I don't believe I have heard that before. I want, would like to ask you if I heard you correctly. This is in one of the programs or two of the programs. Did you say $12,800,000 per job? Right. And this was in just one of the programs or two of the programs? No, this is a, a total has been spent at that time. It was $15 billion, billion and 1,175 jobs were created, 1, which ends up to be $12,800,000 per job. Um, I, I think the American people would absolutely be stunned to understand that that's what's going on in our government. I mean, it, you can't even characterize that as waste, fraud, and abuse. I, it's so bad. I, I, I don't think I've ever heard. Have you ever heard in the federal government of a program that has spent that kind of money? Well, I know of a lot of programs spent that weren't very effective, but I've never heard one with that, that amount of dollars per job. And you know, the whole thing about 1703, 1705, that bothers a lot of us is that here you have the federal government using taxpayers' dollars to be venture capitalists for exceptionally risky projects. Well, I don't think that's the role of the federal government, and I, I doubt that very many citizens in the country, particularly those who are working hard, paying their taxes, and 
doing what they think is the right thing to do. I don't think they'd be very happy to see that their hard-earned money is being wasted in this way. Um, I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, no, I hope one is that the rule will allow there to be uh, amendments offered, and, uh, and and we certainly will advocate for that. Um, uh, I continue to believe that uh, investing in a green economy and green jobs is an important thing, and I hope uh, that uh, uh, we're not walking away from that. That's the future, uh, whether you want to, whether you like it or not. And um, we certainly invest a lot in, in energy that pollutes, that uh, results in all kinds of. Uh, uh, extraneous costs that we have to deal with. Uh, but just putting this hearing, this, this, uh, this cylinder issue aside for a second, um, I mean, I think what the American people are stunned at is that we have serious problems in our country where we have people who are not working. Uh, we have people who are looking for the federal government to be a partner, to be a friend, to help respond to some of the crises. And we've come here for a few days after a long recess, and we're taking up bills that are not going anywhere. Uh, and this bill could be brought up in the lame duck session. It could have been brought up, you know, before we we we, we recess. But we only have a few days here, and it just seems like in these few days we're going to do absolutely nothing. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, but but even that represents kind of the failure. We we didn't pass all of our appropriations bill here in the House, so you can't blame everything on the Senate. Yeah, well, you know, uh, but the fact of the matter is, um, that's it. I think this is an incredible waste of time uh, that we are not taking advantage of this opportunity to try to find common ground or where we can agree, you know, on things to, to actually move this economy forward. You know, you don't have to agree on everything to agree on something. And as I, know, I know there's something that we all, have, we all can come to some sort of an agreement on, and that's what we should be spending these few days uh, doing. And so, I mean, no disrespect to the... Uh, uh, gentleman who testified, but I, I, you know, I, I don't believe the Senate's going to take this up, and I don't believe that uh, the president's going to sign this into law. And you know, and you got to, you got some film footage for a TV commercial, all fine and nice. But at the end of the day, you know, I think we're neglecting the people's business, and I regret that very much. So I give back my time. Mr. Stearns, could you just tell me one more time how much money, taxpayer money, was lost in these first? failed programs under this program? In the cylinder program, $535 million. And in the other programs? Um, our balance uh, was $400 million, uh, of which $68 million was dispersed. Beacon Power was $400 million, and uh, $40 million was dispersed. Is the microphone turned on? I'm sorry, let me speak. Uh, a balance, uh, we had $400 million was approved for a bound, which went into bankruptcy. But only $68 million was dispersed. Uh, and I would point out, and in, in all candid, because we brought to the attention the failures of Abound, I think that stopped the Department of Energy from giving them the full $400 million. So I think, in a sense, we can say the committee, Oversight Committee, stopped and saved uh, over $300 million, which would have been lost in this bankruptcy. Uh, Beacon Power had $43 million approved, $39 million dispersed. Uh, Nevada Geothermal, which has substantial debt, no cash flow, uh, they've given them almost $100 million. Uh, first win, uh, they've approved $117 million, and they have substantial debt. Uh, they can't uh, get together an IPO, which they intended to do. And when you go down these lists and you see that uh, uh, this program started out at $34 billion in loan guarantees, and you just start to realize that none of these are economically viable. As Mr. Whitfield pointed out, they're not creating jobs that make any sense in terms of $12 million a job. We could certainly go into the, the private sector and give this money to universities, to research and development. I mean, there's so many ways to make this work in this country uh, that it's obviously a disappointment to think that the administration is so strong and hell-bent on this green energy uh, at the expense of good economic sense. I'm under the assumption that your committee considers this to be a significant amount of money and a significant issue. And I would tend to agree with you on that. Yeah. This is definitely worth our effort to try and save the taxpayer money and to try and do the program the right way. Now I'll make one additional comment on this issue. On the 1705 program, not only uh, were the loan guarantees made, but there were $6 billion available just to reimburse the companies that 
that they incurred the cost they incurred in submitting the application. I think on the on behalf of taxpayers everywhere, we thank you for your efforts on this particular issue. You know, we heard these facts and these feelings, but let me remind this uh, committee that we are not eliminating the loan program with this administration. The loan program, in all, is we are trying to maximize the loan program one way to find them and, and uh, uh, some other way. Uh, they're not some other they're not interchangeable. Uh, I always uh, say that there's the one way to find them uh, has had uh, financial success and uh, the other success is that has a general organization and it is actually it's um, sold 65 dollars uh, or 100 dollars or 400 dollars or 100 dollars or less than that. It's a full of dollars or dollars for dollars from a conversation with sales from a price and it's a full of dollars or dollars or dollars or dollars. It's called the Chinese and the dollars and the money and the money and the money and the money. Mr. Chairman, if I could just conclude here, I, I appreciate all three witnesses who I think have done a good job in convincing me that this is a significant issue. It is dealing with a great deal of money, and it is dealing with uh, correcting abuses that have happened with a great deal of money. And I think it's a wise, wise decision to discuss this right now. And I thank all three witnesses, because I think you've all spoken to the significance of having this before us. Yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Stern. If this bill was enacted today and an organization submitted um, uh, their application with a new brilliant idea for renewable energy, would they be able to apply and qualify for uh, the DOE loan program? Not on the, not on the 1705 loan guarantee program. No, they wouldn't. Okay. But they could go to, there's lots of other ways, as you know, Judge, that they could submit applications either through the military, through the universities, and other ways to get uh, support if it's a great innovative idea. And obviously, if it's a really good idea, venture capitalists and hedge funds will support it, and it'll go well, public and make a lot of money. Yeah, you also said that, and, and I don't hold you to this, that innovation starts with private companies. I wrote it down when you said it. Uh, you wouldn't include the Internet in that. You would well, include many kinds of 
uh, undertakings that didn't start with private I would companies. include the, the iPhone, the iPad, um, a lot of things that Apple has mm -hmm. done did not start, but uh, culminated through the creativity of Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. Jobs and Steve Jobs just has done what I think we believe in America is the right way to do it is to have the innovation come from the free market because if it can't make it then it fails and taxpayers are not at risk. The real question is, Judge, do we want to have taxpayers involved with innovation when the possibility is not, makes no economic sense? Yeah, well the 15B loan uh, uh, program, uh, the way you all are calculating it is, is as if it's dollars spent. And in many respects, some of the money will be paid back. Uh, I might add, um, looking back at Solyndra, um, that has become the poster child, um, they built their building on time, all of that fabulous structure, whatever it was there, and um, ahead of schedule, as a matter of fact. And I would assume at this point um, uh, that some of what's out there uh, uh, would be recouped, but not just in, in uh, uh, Solyndra, it's, it's the jobs uh, that uh, are created, and there are many of them. I, I do agree that I think that there is an ideological difference with regard to um, uh, the future of this country and who is um, are likely to be involved. But let me, let, me, let me go back to the loan program and ask a little bit about its history. Well, under, under whose administration? did the loan program originate? Well, I've been asked that question many times, and obviously it started under the Bush administration. In, in, in 2005? Yes, and in fact, um, as uh, you'll realize, uh, it was supported by the Bush administration, and a lot of Republicans supported it. But I would point out to you, not one loan guarantee was issued under the Bush administration. In fact, uh, Solyndra came up, but Solyndra was not approved because the administration felt that uh, some of the information uh, they wanted to have more due diligence on, and also I think there was some apprehension of whether this should go forward. So yeah. to answer your question, you're correct, it was started on the Bush administration. And, and Solyndra was an applicant it initially, was an applicant. Under, initially of the 143 applicants uh, under the Bush administration. But as I say, the Bush administration did not approve it. And it was approved uh, under the Obama administration. Exactly. And you talked with Matt Rogers at length, I'm sure, in your committee mm -hmm. and uh, in other ways. Uh, did Matt Rogers at any time say that there was political pressure um, uh, that caused him, uh, he's the person that took up the loan package when the Obama administration uh, took well, office? I, th I think I probably can't answer that uh, Clearly, because I think the political pressure came after Solyndra was in the pipeline. All right. And, and the emails we had showed that the White House was intimately involved with trying to make it successful. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they brought in two hedge funds um, and that they had people in the Department of Energy who were uh, very strong supporters of Obama, bundlers and contributors actually in the George room. Kaiser being one of those. Well, George Kaiser and then uh, the senior loan officer at the Department of Energy. Would let, me ask you, let me ask you uh, additionally, were there other investors in Solyndra uh, other than George Kaiser? Uh, he was the predominantly the big one. In what Arsenal. about the Waltons of Walmart? The Waltons were in, in the other, uh, Madrone was the other uh, mm hedge fund that invested in it, that's true. Were there Republican donors that contributed well, I th I to think, Solyndra? Well, I think Walmart contributed across the board. No, but... Can I, can I add one something? Of no, course. Two, these two hedge funds, because they subordinated taxpayers, when Solyndra went into bankruptcy, they gave bonus out to these executives to keep them there, and these hedge funds were able to get the remnants of Solyndra at... Ten cents on a dollar or less. Yeah, I hear you, and not only. And so yeah. you know, that shows highly political for them to subordinate and let the hedge funds make out. So they got all this raw material, and they got all this additional equipment from Solyndra on ten cents on a dollar, and they can use that. Whereas taxpayers got nothing. I mean, yeah, it should but be there was some other. All of there us. was some other people, uh, Mr. Stearns, Frito Lay, for example. Uh, a lot of investors uh, went down. Some the bad loans are made. And uh, in this particular instance, in order uh, in, in Silicon Valley, and I, I, I'm not conversant with that kind of uh, technology and 
uh, risk uh, that are involved. But when venture capital uh, or uh, the government is involved in a number of things uh, like that, um, they have a thing they call the valley of death. And at that valley of death is where great risk starts uh, uh, being undertaken. I don't want to go there because um, I will display, among other things, uh, that I, I, you know, I don't, I, I, I'm not a fan of uh, hedge funds, not only as it pertains to this particular event, but I doggone sure I ain't a fan of them for all the foreclosures that are, have gone on in this country and how they bundle folks' uh, money and people can't even, in mine in your state, people can't even find out who the lenders were. Judges can't even do foreclosure they because can't. they went all over the place. Can't find the title. Exactly. And so when the deal goes down, uh, I understand um, uh, uh, the concern that some have. I question Mr. Whitfield's uh, math. Um, with reference to the number of um, uh, uh, jobs for a specific program. I could take the $90 billion, $90 billion in the stimulus program and uh, show, uh, as um, uh, uh, Mr. Rush has, um, a number of things that the future of this country will benefit from. Uh, the establishment of um, uh, solar installations in this country has soared um, uh, significantly. And we do have at this point, and you see it occasionally on television, the world's largest um, uh, uh, wind farm. Um, and more important, something that's going to be really, really important, uh, way beyond my lifetime and all of us in here, is the electric grid uh, that has created a new domestic battery <coughs> in, uh, industry that may give... Um, uh, you all a bit of heartburn in places like Ohio when it comes uh, to uh, politics. But I want to follow your logic on one thing and stop there in the interest of time. You said, and I'm talking to you, Mr. Stern, that uh, China is subsidizing its loan, its uh, solar program by $30 billion. And I don't, I don't deny that. I don't know what they're subsidizing. They subsidize pretty much everything. I think you and I went to China together at some point. But uh, if, if I follow your logic, then are we to give up on the solar program? No, I, I think that the United States has to come up with more ingenious and more proprietary way to do solar panels that makes it much more uh, efficient than what the Chinese are doing so that when we go out in the market, we can beat them because we've got a better product. But, you know, uh, Milton Friedman is somebody that I believe in in his Free to Choose book. He said if, if, a, if a, a country is subsidizing a nation, then don't buy their product, but don't subsidize your own because, in, a, in effect, you can't compete and you're not developing good products because two nations are continuing to subsidize their product and you're not getting the innovation. So the United States must look at what the solar panels the Chinese are doing and say, we can make it better. We can do the iPad of solar panels and the Frick with what, how much money the Chinese want to give, their product's going to go down the tube because our product's better. So we've yeah. got to come up with that I think, of the solar I panel. think that this country can compete with anybody, and I think uh, that the private and the public sector have demonstrated that often. I also know for a fact, and if I were to get the list of uh, companies that went bankrupt on all administrations' watch, then I could show you if I just went in the Defense Department alone and saw some of the contractors that got loans that never paid a dime. And somewhere along the lines, uh, we have to get real. I accept the fact that uh, Solyndra was a bust, but lenders uh, do make bad loans, and uh, regrettably uh, that has happened in this particular instance, and I don't think that there was any political uh, shenanigans uh, other than um, uh, the fact that uh, there were politicians, Republicans and Democrats, that contributed to Solyndra. I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I happen to represent an area in Georgia where we have the largest manufacturer of high-efficiency solar panels in the world, uh, and just tremendously proud of the work that they're, uh, that they're doing. Uh, the bust at Solyndra has helped them not at all. Uh, I'm confused, though, about a comment uh, that Mr. Hastings uh, made, and Mr. Stearns, you may be able to, to help me with it, talking about the facts and the figures uh, here, uh, and that these were these were loans and, and loan guarantees, and so some of these uh, uh, numbers 
are written as if the entire dollar value was was lost. So when we talk about Solyndra receiving a $527 million loan guarantee, Solyndra paid back how much of that $527 million? Well, we're thinking it might be after the bankruptcy. It could be possibly $20 million, uh, but it's still, we're still waiting. And this is bankruptcy court is still going on. And as you know, right after Solyndra went bankrupt, the FBI raided it. And so there's an FBI investigation going on. So, um, and I would point out when Solyndra uh, tried to do an IPO, um, the accounting firm came in and found out the books were not proper, and so they pulled the IPO. So to answer your question, I think how much the taxpayers get back is going to be very dubious. So it's it's virtually every penny that went out the door, I, unless we're going to get it back in the 10 cents on the dollar fire sale after all the other creditors are, are, are paid. It, it, if, if these numbers are inflated, they're inflated only by the dollars that we have not received back uh, yet, but your expectation is low. And, and the two hedge funds get first crack. First crack. American taxpayer gets Second what's left crack. over. All right. I thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to thank uh, Representative Stearns uh, for all his years of service uh, to this body. Uh, and he has done it in a very distinguished, a distinguished way. I also want to thank him for his leadership on the slender issue and really isolating uh, the lack of accountability where ideology got in the way of accountability. While we all want certain things to work, sometimes they just don't. And while, you know, my good friend Mr. Hastings said that, you know, uh, Loans go bad, but typically they're not backed up by the United States government or taxpayers. And so I just want to thank you for your service and for your uh, diligence on this particular issue and this legislation. Three, and uh, we will... Everyone have a copy of the rule? The chair will be uh, in receipt of a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee to grant H.J. Res. 117 the continuing appropriations resolution 2013 a closed rule. Rule provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on their appropriations. Rule waives all points of order in consideration of the joint resolution. Rule provides that the joint resolution shall be considered as read. Rule waives all points of order against provisions in joint resolution. Rule provides one motion to recommit. The rule also provides for consideration of HR 6365, the National Security and Job Protection Act, under a closed rule. Rule provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member on the committee on budget. Rule waives all points for order against consideration. Bill rule provides that the rule shall be considered read. The rule waives all points for order against the bill. Finally, the rule provides one motion to recommit. You've heard the motion of the uh, gentleman from uh, from Dallas. Any um, discussion or amendment? Mr. Ms. McGovern? Do you have a Ms. Lutter? I do. Oh, Ms. Lutter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule. I move the committee make an order, give necessary waivers for the amendment by Mr. Van Hollen, which would actually achieve the savings necessary to eliminate the sequester and do so in a balanced, practical way. <coughs> Mr. Van Hollen's worked extremely hard on this issue. Uh, I know that we've all heard him uh, in the national media explaining what he wants to do, which makes eminently good sense, and we would very much like to see Mr. Van Hollen be given the opportunity before his colleagues here to present this to the House of Representatives. Vote occurs on a slaughter member. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed no. Pay the chair. The no's have it. The no's have it. The uh, clerk will roll. Mr. Sessions. No. Mr. Sessions. No. Ms. Fox. No. Ms. Fox. No. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Woodall. No. Mr. Woodall. No. Mr. Nugent. No. Mr. Nugent. No. Mr. Scott. No. Mr. Scott. No. Mr. Webster. Mr. Webster, no. Ms. Slaughter. Aye. Ms. Slaughter, aye. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Polis. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Three yeas, eight nays.
the amendment is not agreed to. There further amendments yeah, the, to the government. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule. I move the committee grant H.J. Res. 117 and H.R. 6365 open rules so that all members have the opportunity to offer amendments to these bills on the floor. Vote occurs in the government amendment. Those in favor will say Those opposed, no. no. The chair, the As have, for roll call. Call the roll. Mr. Sessions. No. Mr. Sessions, no. Mrs. Fox. No. Ms. Fox, no. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop, no. Mr. Woodall. No. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Nugent. No. Mr. Nugent, no. Mr. Scott. No. Mr. Scott, no. Mr. Webster. No. Mr. Webster, no. Ms. Slaughter. Aye. Ms. Slaughter, aye. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Polis, Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Clerk, the total? Three yeas, eight nays. And the amendment is not agreed to. The further amendments, if not, the vote occurs. The motion of the gentleman from Bellis is in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. 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 The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. Mr. And uh, clerk, call the roll. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Mr. Sessions, aye. Ms. Fox. Aye. Ms. Fox, aye. Mr. Bishop. Aye. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Nugent. Aye. Mr. Nugent, aye. Mr. Scott. Scott, aye. Mr. Webster. Mr. Webster, aye. Ms. Slaughter. No. Ms. Slaughter, no. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. McGovern, no. Mr. Hastings. Okay. Mr. Hastings, no. Mr. Polis. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman, Clerk aye. Clerk total? Eight yeas, three nays. And the uh, motion is agreed to, and the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Woodall, will be managing for the majority. Mr. Hastings for the minority. And Mr. Hastings for the minority. And the chair will be in receipt of a second motion. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 6213, the No More Slenders Act, a structured rule rule provides 90 minutes of general debate be controlled, equal to divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member on the Committee on Energy and Commerce Rule waves all points of order against consideration of the bill. The bill makes an order as original text for the purpose of amendment. An amendment in the nature of a substitute consists of the text of Rules Committee Print 112-31 and provides that it shall be considered as res rule raise all points of order against consideration in the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Rule makes an order only those amendments printed in the rules can be reported. Such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated. The report shall be considered as read, shall be debatable at time specified in the report, equal to dividing control by the proponent and opponent, shall not be subject to amendment, shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. Rule weighs all points of order against the amendments printed in the report. The rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Finally, Section 2 of the rule authorizes the Speaker to entertain motions to suspend the rules at any time on the legislative day of September 20th, 2012, or September 21st, 2012. We've heard the motion of the gentleman. Uh, any uh, discussion or amendment? If not, the vote occurs. The gentleman has a motion. Yes, Mr. Oh, Chairman. Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to the rule. I move the committee grant H.R. 1613 an open rule so that all members have the opportunity to offer amendments. On, uh, to this bill on the floor. I want to add just one thing, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McGovern mentioned earlier um, uh, the do-nothing Congress. I was here, as were uh, some of us on this committee, when Democrats were accused of being a do-nothing Congress. Um, and I just want to make the record clear that in this session of Congress, uh, what we've allowed for is 61 measures that have been signed into law, and that's the worst record in 60 years. Vote occurs on the uh, Hastings Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. Those aye. opposed, no. Pay the chair the uh, no's have it. The so clerk, call the roll. Mr. Sessions. Mr. Sessions, no. Ms. Fox. No. Ms. Fox, no. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop, no. Mr. Woodall. No. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Nugent. No. Mr. Nugent, no. Mr. Scott. No. Scott, no. Mr. Webster. Mr. Webster, no. Ms. Slaughter. Aye. Ms. Slaughter, aye. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Polis, Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Clerk, the total? Three yeas, eight nays. And the amendment is not agreed to. There are further amendments. If not, the vote occurs. The motion of the gentleman from Dallas. Those in favor say aye. Those aye. Aye. No. No. Yes, the aye. Aye. The motion is agreed to, and this will be handled please. by the... Oh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Mr. Sessions, aye. Ms. Fox. Aye. Ms. Fox, aye. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Nugent. Mr. Nugent, aye. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott, aye. Mr. Webster. Mr. Webster, aye. Ms. Slaughter. No. Ms. Slaughter, no. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. McGovern, no. Mr. Hastings. Mr. Hastings, no. Mr. Polis. Mr. Chairman. Aye. 
Chairman, aye. Mr. Clerk, the total? Eight yeas, three nays. And the motion is agreed to, and this will be handled by Mr. Sessions for the majority. Mr. McGovern for the Mr. Minority. Mr. McGovern, thank you all very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. do you anticipate any more committee action this week? Uh, I don't anticipate any more meetings this week, and so we want to say um, happy Rosh Hashanah to uh, our friends as we uh, head into next week, and we will be reconvening... Um, Next uh, Wednesday, I guess. Next Wednesday. I wanted to ask about that as well. The place is rife with rumors that we won't be coming back next week. No, is that cool. your sense of it? Uh, that's not what I've heard. So. That's word going around. Okay. Thank you very much. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned.